This is my new book. It is YA, but it's young YA, so a 12-year-old can safely read it. There's nothing in it for the educators out there that is questionable other than manimals. Uh, before that, I wrote Middle Grade, Dark Life and Riptide, and I'm asked a lot with science fiction, I think a lot of authors are asked a lot, how you come up with your ideas. And even as I was signing books a little while ago, several kids asked me that. Because my ideas are pretty crazy, and I admit to it. With Dark Life, it's about pioneers in the future that live on the ocean floor. And the kids get special abilities because they're growing up on the ocean floor with all the water pressure on their brains. So their brains alter slightly. Uh, and Riptide is the sequel to that. And it's very much, they're both very much Westerns with outlaws, and I pick up pioneer culture. Inhuman's very different, and the premise behind Inhuman is a, a big virus hits America about 20 years from now, 20 years in the future, and it hits the East Coast. And everybody who is healthy runs to the West and leaves all the sick, infected people in the East. And they build a giant wall right down the Mississippi River along the West Bank to keep all the infected people away. Uh, I wanted to show the Mississippi River because some people ask me, can't they just swim across the infected people? But the Mississippi is really big. You can't swim across it. And when I was doing research for it after I had the idea, I started looking at giant walls. And there's a lot of giant walls in the world. And this wall goes from Canada all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, and it's 700 feet tall. And that's an image, I hope I'm not in the way, can you guys see, of my giant wall. And my heroine is a 16-year-old girl named Lane. And she grew up on the west side of the wall, where it's very safe, and she is very afraid of germs. Uh, she has to go to the east side of the wall, called the feral zone, and she doesn't know what's there. The virus is based a tiny bit on a fact from swine flu that I learned. And the way I come up with science fiction ideas is when I read something in science that makes me uncomfortable or I can picture something really wrong happening with it, whether it's new science or new technology, I put it in a file, that, that fact, or I file it even in my brain. And I was trying to think of what would be an interesting virus. And I remembered a fact about swine flu that had made me uncomfortable. And that was that swine flu carries pig DNA on it. That's why it's called swine flu. And the thought of catching a virus that had pig DNA on it, that made me uncomfortable. And my brain started working. Well, what if you were to start getting pig qualities, physical qualities? In real life, you don't. If you get swine flu, you do not get hooves or a nose. But in my book, you do. And there are, so don't do this. <laughs> in my book, there are 50 different strains of the virus. So there are 50 different animals you can start to mutate into. You would never mutate all the way because you still have a lot of human DNA. And you would just start to mutate a little bit, a little bit. And I sort of modeled the rabies. Uh, disease where the virus works its way into the infected creature's brain and then they go crazy. And so with my disease, you mutate, you mutate, and you keep your personality and you're still emotionally human until the virus works its way into your brain and you go feral and it's like getting rabid. So you might start with just getting a nose and then go a little farther until finally you're a full-on manimal in my book and then you get vicious and you want to bite. So my girl has to go under the wall. She goes through a tunnel to the other side of the Mississippi. Well, she gets to the other side of the wall at the Mississippi River. And there's an island in the Mississippi River called Arsenal Island in my book. It's Rock Island in real life. It's right next to Moline. It's a very real place. And she meets a guard there. And she makes her way to the east side of the river. And what she finds over there is a destroyed world because everybody left it. And I wanted to see how fast our world would go to pot, our civilization and our cities, if 19 years ago everybody left and the people that were there did not take care of it. 
And I was shocked when I did the research at how fast everything falls apart. Buildings and plants take over. So anybody recognize this? This is all from the documentary. It's a series of um, episodes on the History Channel about life without people. And I took these images. This is someplace in Chicago. Anyone recognize it? Want to take a guess? Anyone want to take a guess? It's Wrigley Field. This is Wrigley Field five years. If there were nobody there, it, after people have left, five years, the walls would start to fall down and the green would overgrow everything. So I thought that was pretty amazing. And these are the images I used. Here's another one. This is two years of an abandoned house. It's in Tennessee where it's a little warmer so plants grow a little faster. But within two years, you can't even see the house. It goes so crazy. So this is the world that my girl moves into. She goes from west of the Mississippi, a clean city, into this. And what she finds in the ruins of society are mutated, infected people, animals. And she has to do a task in order to save her father and get back to the west. Now, some of the people there that are mutated with the virus are still quite sane, and they live in little compounds to stay safe. But then there are other ones that are ferocious and living in the wild and quite insane. And the virus doesn't only infect people, it also infects animals. So you get these weird mashups of a coyote infected with cobra or other things. You can only catch the virus once. So I had fun making animal mashups also. And then I had someone ask me, except if you got a tiny bit of DNA from another animal in you, it wouldn't really mutate you very much. It wouldn't affect you at all. And I had to point out that actually the tiniest bit of alteration in DNA does affect you. This is science that is illegal in America, but it's being done in Korea. And it's a puppy. And as an embryo, they put the tiniest speck of sea anemone DNA in him to make him glow in the dark. And they're doing that with lots and lots of animals. So you can look online and you can see glow-in-the-dark cats and glow-in-the-dark pigs. And that is from one tiny little tiny drop of DNA in him from a sea anemone. They also take DNA from jellyfish and make them glow. For the kids who have read Dark Life out there, and I have my pioneers have glowing skin, this is kind of what I was modeling. When she's over in the West, oh, you can't really see it, but she meets a wild boy over there who is a feral hunter. Because when the ferals go totally crazy and become aggressive, some of them turn rogue and get a taste for human meat. And so they start hunting down the humans that live over there. And this boy is paid to go hunt those rogues down. It's like a rogue bear or a rogue mountain lion. And my antagonist is a tiger man, and I had a lot of fun with this. So there's my girl getting ready to go to the other side of the wall. Um, I'm asked how I write for any of you would-be writers. I make collages of these images because I found them so stimulating and powerful. And I prop them up in front of my desk when I'm writing certain scenes so that I can pretend that I'm living in the environment if I have lots of abandoned buildings, or that I've come face to face with a tiger guy. So that is my newest book. It's been out for two weeks now, and I will be signing books up there, and I know that they're selling all three books in the booth next to mine. Can I answer any questions about this book, about Riptide and Dark Life, or even about writing? Yeah. Do you want to ask in here? Well, what, what, what would happen uh, if in, in human, uh, your, new, your newest book, uh, what would happen if someone got uh, uh, the DNA from an animal that is already mutated? That's a great question. If the animal, uh, an animal-animal hybrid, he can only pass on the DNA that he's infected with. He wouldn't pass on, so if it's a pig's wolf and he's infected with wolf, he wouldn't pass on pig DNA. He only passes on the virus that he has. However, if two pigs with two different DNAs infected have baby pigs, the baby pigs have three DNAs in them. So I get mashups further down the line that get creepier and grosser as I go on.
It was a good question. Also, they're doing manimal pictures up there. So if you come up where I'm signing books and get your picture taken, you can pick an animal and they'll mutate your face so that you become a manimal into a certain kind of animal. And they're going to post it online. Yeah. What is my educational background that allows me to come up with messed up science like this? Is that what you're asking? So I went to a science school for undergrad. And then I went for graduate school to get an MFA in screenwriting. So my writing is very filmic. It's very visual, very action oriented. I've got a lot of big whammy scenes because I love action. But the science, I did get a BS, which is a bachelor in science. I did that because my father was a professor there and I got free tuition. So I was kind of forced into those classes. I love reading science fiction and watching it, so that's part of it. A love of um, other worlds, day tripping into other cultures and other worlds that are completely invented. Um, for the kids, do you guys know the difference between fantasy and science fiction? Because they get shelved a lot together, science fiction and fantasy. Anybody? I'm getting nothing. Yeah, go ahead. F fantasy is like where things that are just impossible. Science fiction is what, where things could be possible. That is perfect. That was a perfect, perfect definition. The reason they get lumped together is they're both alternative worlds. They're not our world in present day. And alternative worlds, one is about the impossible, as he said, and one is about the possible, even though it's an alternative world. So Harry Potter, science fiction or fantasy? Right, fantasy. There are no wizards, and we will never have magic along those lines. However, rocket ships, we already have them. That's not even science fiction. How about living on another planet? Science fiction or fantasy? I think so, too. I think there are probably some scientists that say it's fantasy, but I think Are there any other questions? Yeah. What science fiction authors do I love? For old school sci-fi, I love Jack Finney, because he does a lot of time travel, and that's always interesting to me. Um, a lot of YA sci-fi, and a lot of dystopia recently, which is not quite sci-fi because it's political, but when it has new inventions like Cinder and Scarlet, if you guys have read any of Melissa Myers, that's wonderful. I enjoy that when they start creating interesting technology, like cyborgs. Um, any other questions? Yeah. He asked if there will OK, come over here. Any movies? Uh, Disney optioned Dark Life before it even was published. The um, Scholastic had bought it, but it hadn't come out yet. And Disney optioned it. And Robert Zemeckis was attached to it. And he wrote a draft of it. And he was going to direct it, but then he and Disney got a divorce. And so I don't know if it will ever happen. It's in Disney's hands now for the next two years. The others, Inhuman hasn't been sent out to Hollywood yet. So I'm hoping. What is next? Um, Scholastic bought this as a three book deal. So they want a trilogy. And I have the other two books outlined. And so I know what's going to happen in them. Hopefully, I'll get them out one a year. We'll see. Another question? What inspired me to write in Human? I was looking for another idea after these, and I knew I wanted to do near future sci-fi again. And it really was me thinking about um, what would be fun, what weird science lately would be fun to twist and make awful. And that's when I thought about swine flu. But what really did it is a couple weeks after knowing about swine flu and the pig DNA, I read about scientists doing something called viral transduction. And all that means is they take a virus and they give it to a plant. And plant picks up DNA from it. I mean, the virus picks up DNA from the plant. And then they infect another plant with that virus to transfer the DNA over. They're doing it to try and make plants hardier to certain bugs and all. They're doing it for good reasons, but they are using viruses to transfer DNA in plants. And I thought, it is only a matter of time before they do that with animals. And I don't think that's a good idea. So that is what my inspiration was. Another question? We, OK. I am, and I know it's difficult. Thanks for your patience with the whole sound thing. 
I will be up in the booth. And if you guys have questions when I'm signing, feel free to ask me. I'm happy to talk with you guys. And get pictures of yourself as an, a manimal, because that's kind of fun. Thanks. Thanks.